Hi everyone, I'm David Fisher, and this is Presidential Chronicles, the series of books and videos on American history as seen through the lives of the presidents of the United States. This episode is from the life of Herbert Hoover, and the focus is the great humanitarian. The year is 1917, and the United States has just entered World War I, no longer neutrals. That meant Hoover could no longer be responsible to lead the effort to feed the Belgian people. Had to be a neutral, and that responsibility, he passed that off to a couple of other nations. But President Woodrow Wilson still had a role for Hoover to be involved, because he wanted to bring the full might of the United States into this effort. That meant military, it meant economic, and it meant food, a critical element to feeding the troops, to feeding the allies, critical to winning this war. He wanted to make Hoover the food czar of the United States, but Hoover didn't like that title. He thought it was too authoritarian, so they settled upon food administrator. And Hoover just had a couple of conditions before he took the role. Number one, he wanted to make sure the United States would continue its commitment to feed the Belgian people. And President Wilson was fine with this. Number two, he had to be in charge. A single note of authority working directly for the president. He didn't have time in a time of war for bureaucracies and councils and things like that. Single decision making was necessary. If this was gonna work, President Wilson was fine with, with this as well. Hoover's philosophy dramatically increased food production in the United States and decreased consumption in the United States. So they could feed the troops, they could feed the allies. And his core principle in all of this was to make it voluntary. Many of the European countries had put compulsory terms on its people in terms of food preparation and uh, production and consumption. And a lot of that failed. It had a lot of bureaucracy and corruption and inefficiencies in it. And Hoover thought the right answer was to appeal to American patriotism. And in fact, it was a phenomenal success. Many direct appeals from Hoover to the American people. The whole foundation of democracy, he said, lies in the individual initiative of its people and their willingness to serve the interests of the nation with complete self-effacement in the time of emergency. I hold that democracy can yield to discipline. We can solve this food problem for our own people and for our allies by voluntary action. They had a slogan, food will win the war. He introduced meatless Tuesdays, wheatless Wednesdays, sweetless Saturdays. He appealed to women. After all, women at the time certainly prepared most of the meals. And the phrase to hooverize became part of the vernacular is to adopt all of these methods to try to generate the necessary food to win the war. And Hoover said, look, every little bit counts. In no other field do small things, when multiplied by our 100 million people, count for so much. 20 million Americans pledged their active support to Hooverize on behalf of the war effort. Now, the U.S. soldiers wouldn't actually get into the fight for about a year. It took them about a year to mobilize, but food was needed immediately for the cause of the Allies. It fueled that fight, and it was needed because the Germans had gotten in its blitz to within 60 miles of Paris, the capital of France, and by the time the Americans arrived, things still kind of perilous. But fortunately, when the American soldiers came in, the counterattack could begin. Summer of 1918 was brutal fighting, but the Americans really did make the difference, in part because even though they lost 100,000 Americans that summer, the Americans were bringing in 10,000 new soldiers every day, whereas the Central Powers had no reinforcements left. At this point, it was a matter of time. They sued for peace in the fall, and the armistice took place. November 11th of 1918. In the midst of that, there was political and economic chaos across Europe. Now, Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, went to Paris to lead the American delegation in the peace talks, vying for his 14 points and a League of Nations, but to win the peace required immediate action, and that meant food. There were millions starving across Europe, and there was a concern in the West that the Bolsheviks, who had now taken over in Russia after the Russian Revolution, might fill that vacuum by spreading communism, perhaps bringing food to starving people, and all of a sudden uh, the West would, would lose the eastern part of Europe, perhaps, to the communists. Now, Wilson immediately formed the American Relief Association to try to, or, or administration to try to address this, the ARA, and he put Hoover in charge reporting directly to the big four at the peace talks in Paris. David Lloyd George of Britain, George Clemenceau from France, Vittorio Orlando of Italy, and of course, President Wilson from the United States. Now all were fine, go deliver food to the allies and to the liberated countries. 
but you're not delivering food, they told Hoover, to any of the former central powers, like Germany and Austria, where millions were potentially starving and Hoover was shut off by the British blockade. They were not going to give aid and comfort to what they can still consider the enemy until the peace talks were concluded. Well, Hoover was beside himself about this. He thought it made absolutely no sense. He got into an argument with the British Admiral, Sir Rosalind Weymouth, who told Hoover, young man, I don't see why you Americans want to feed these Germans. Well, Hoover didn't get mad often, but he did in this case and responded, old man, I don't understand why you want to starve women and children after they are whipped. Well, he got started on the mission right away. He aligned with uh, American General John Pershing, who loaned him about 2,500 soldiers, almost all of whom were draftees who had relevant backgrounds in this space, logistics and things like that. The U.S. Navy also helping to deliver wherever he could, including to the liberated countries, but still nothing to Germany, nothing to Austria. Austria. Four months Hoover had to argue with the big four before David Lloyd George, the premier of Britain, finally helped convince his colleagues that yes, they can go in and feed these, uh, these nations as well. People died on the process, but Hoover was finally able to go and deliver on this mission. He also had some trouble back at home. Not everybody was aligned at home in the United States with feeding countries like Germany that the Americans had just faced in war. Henry Cabot Lodge, senator from the United States, thought about putting some legislation in motion to, to stop this. And again, Hoover couldn't understand this. He said that the Americans refuse to kick a man in the stomach after we have licked him. That's what we have to do. We have not been fighting women and children. We're not beginning now. No matter how deeply we may feel at the present moment, our vision must stretch over the next hundred years. We must write now into history such acts as will stand credibly in the minds of our grandchildren and eventually the obstacles in the United States stood down as well. Now this mission was always perilous. There were checkpoints everywhere, especially in those former uh, countries of the central powers. This got tricky at times to the point where Hoover had a, had a card to play. He would simply threaten to leave whether it was cities or whole countries. If you give us trouble, don't let us deliver this food uh, without difficulty, we'll just stop. Well, whenever he made those threats, the trouble typically ended. And it wasn't just food that the ARA was providing. Clothing, medicine, they cleared rivers for transit. They built 30,000 miles of new railroad tracks, built hospitals, schools, roads, ports, telegraph lines, all these things to try to bring relief to the chaos that was in Europe. Now, Hoover did his best to stay out of politics until he couldn't. The Woodrow Wilson was starting to cave in the peace talks on a number of his 14 points. And Hoover was hearing about this, about the peace talks in Paris, and he was really nervous because Wilson wanted to do anything he could to keep his League of Nations. But for that, he was giving up many of the points that the Germans initially counted on when they agreed to surrender in the first place. So Hoover wrote Wilson a letter. If the Allies cannot be brought to adopt peace as the, at the basis of the 14 points, he said, we should retire from Europe lock, stock, and barrel. We should lend to the whole world our economic and moral strength, or the world will swim in a sea of misery and disaster worse than the Dark Ages. The problem was Wilson was locked in. He felt he needed to negotiate to get his League of Nations, that even if he had to abandon his principles like self-determination, reasonable reparations, many of those points were dropped. Hoover was distraught over this. In the meantime, Hoover had a side job during this period. He called it Operation Packrat. He had read at one point that there was very little contemporaneous artifacts coming from the French Revolution. Well, he didn't want that happen here for historians in World War I, and he had people on the ground, and he told his folks, collect all the artifacts you can get your hands on. Papers, film, maps, anything from both sides of the war effort to create historical record. He sent $50,000 of his own money to his friend Ray Wilbur, now the president at Stanford University, to try to partner on this uh, opportunity. And Wilbur assigned Professor E.D. Abrams, one of the Stanford professors, to go to Europe to help lead this operation pack rat so they could create ultimately an institution at Stanford to correct all of this material. It would eventually become the Hoover Institute where they would study war and peace for decades to come. 
Fortunately, in the food area, spring crops made all the difference in the following spring when the food mission really wasn't needed anymore. The countries just started to feed their own, and there were opportunities to provide honors for Herbert Hoover really all over the continent. And he declined almost all of them, except a couple. He did accept the French Legion of Honor, and he also took a trip to Belgium to accept a special medal from King Albert. It was called the Friend of the Belgian Nation Medal. It was retired immediately after they gave it to Hoover. He would be the only one who would ever get it. They also handed him a Belgian passport with the word perpetual stamped in it. But maybe the greatest tribute for Hoover for all of this relief effort came in Poland. 50,000 children paraded in front of him to thank him for the efforts of the Americans and in particular Herbert Hoover for really saving so many lives frankly, brought everyone to tears, including Herbert Hoover. A quarter of a century later, Hoover was back in Poland. He was actually representing President Harry Truman at the time, and a woman turned to him at that visit. I am one of the children you fed after the first war. If it were not for you, Mr. Hoover, I would not be alive now, and I guess the same is true of others in this room. One after another nodded their heads in that room, once again bringing tears to the eyes of Herbert Hoover, because this was the bottom line for the great humanitarian, service to his community, saving lives, saving an entire generation. That's what this was all about. Biographer George Nash put it this way, Herbert Hoover was responsible for saving more people than any person in history. That is Herbert Hoover and the great humanitarian from the life of Herbert Hoover. For more Presidential Chronicles, check out my books on Amazon.com and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Until next time, I'm David Fisher and this is Presidential Chronicles.